our feet this morning. Let's praise Jesus together. Lift him high in this place. Wave after wave, mercy arriving again and again. Your love will find us, you're never far away. Battles behind us, battles ahead. God, you are for us, so what stands against? We have this promise, you're never far away. Psalm 86 says, Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. And I love this. This is our prayer for this morning. God, teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. And I will praise you with all my heart, Lord my God, and will honor your name forever. For your faithful love for me is great, and you rescue my life from the depths of Sheol. And God, we ask now that you would unify our mind to fear you. God, that you would uh, 
the, the fears that are overwhelming our hearts now, God, would those crumble at the majesty of your name, at the might of your name and your greatness and your fame. God, help us fear you and nothing else this morning. We need it, God. There are so many of us that are so afraid. We're so scared. God, there's nothing to be afraid of as we walk in the fear of you. And so unify our minds. Give us an undivided mind, an undivided heart to fear you this morning. Come on, God, do that in this place. We need it. We ask you in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, my God.
praise the Lord together this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. And as you do, we just ask you to turn your attention to the screen. We're going to show you a little highlight video from a deep night we had a couple weeks ago over at the land. Amen. And as you can see, I mean, if you want to clap, you guys can clap. I mean, it was awesome. Pretty great. Pretty great. Um, yeah, so as you guys can see, Deep is a very powerful thing within our church. Uh, and we believe as a congregation, joining together, um, praying for our community, praying for our nation, for all the things. And so um, we want to encourage you to join us uh, this Tuesday night. Um, from 7 to 8 p.m. at our church offices um, to pray. And as you guys know, this is our election night in our country, and so we're going to spend time praying for our leaders and our nation and all those things. So we want to invite, invite you out for this powerful night. Um, God truly moves during these things. Now, as we do every single week, uh, we do this thing called a register, okay? Uh, and so the reason why we do this register um, is so that we can know that you're here, that you're watching with us online, um, so that you can fill out anything that you want to be a part of here at Redeemer, um, even the announcements that we'll go through later. Um, and then also just to let us know how we can be praying for you. Again, we say this every single week, but our staff prays faithfully through all the prayer requests every single week. So let us know how we can come alongside of you in those things. Now, a few announcements quickly. Uh, the first one is taking place here today, over here in the prayer room. So after service, you don't have to sign up, just show up and we um, welcome you into that. But we're, we're gonna have this thing called step one. Uh, and step one is essentially where if you're newer here, uh, you get the opportunity to meet our staff, um, our pastors, our our uh, elders, our leadership here at the church. And we just wanna spend time to get to know you um, as well. So it's a, it's a pretty quick meeting, very brief. Uh, and so we want to invite you out to that if you desire. And then um, this next thing is something that we celebrate here at Redeemer, and that is baptism. Um, there we go. There we go. On November the 15th, um, people will be getting baptized during service. And so if you want to be a part of this, if you want to um, talk about and proclaim what Jesus has done in your life, um, you can sign up for this in the register. Uh, and Listen, it's a party, bro. It is a party. We as a church want to celebrate how Jesus has changed your life. So please sign up for this in the register or swing by our Next Steps area, uh, and they can answer all the questions that you need to know. Now, as we continue on in worship, I want to highlight one aspect of worship that we do here in this church, and that is giving. Um, and again, you hear this from us often. Uh, we cannot complete the mission in which the Lord has called us to uh, without your generous giving. And so if you do desire to give, we have multiple ways in which you can. Um, one is on your way out the door today. There's an offering box. If you want to mail in stuff to the office, you can do that as well. Um, or you can go online to our website and give there. But however you want to give, trust me, it is a blessing to our church. It's a blessing to our community. Um, and lives are being changed because of it. As we dive back, back into worship, I'm going to pray for us and just invite the Lord into our time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, um, God, we are so thankful for you. Um, Lord, we are so thankful, um, Lord, that you are a solid rock 
Lord, you are a foundation for us, Lord, um, that you will not be shaken. And Lord, and that we can just rest on you. Lord, even as we go into, Lord, a time that typically brings a lot of tension within our nation. Um, God, may we not have anxiety about that. May we not fear those things, but Lord, may we just um, rest in you. Lord, you take away all of those fears and anxieties. And Lord, and the beautiful thing is, is that nothing happens, Lord, outside of your control. Lord, you still sit on the throne no matter what happens. God, we trust in that. We trust in you. And so, Lord, just continue to have your way. Lord, may our focus be on you today as we worship. Lord, may we just see how beautiful and glorious you are and how big you are, God. So may you be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First service, how are we, man? We doing okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. Hey, we're about to sing a song uh, that just talks about walking in the victory of the cross. I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. And I love this picture of the victory of the cross. You see, the cross was actually a symbol of defeat and death. And, and God, our great and awesome God, took this symbol of defeat and death, flipped it upside down, and now we see it as the symbol of victory. This is amazing. And I want to encourage us as we sing that, you know, God calls us oftentimes to physically express things as we worship. And, and like the physical expression and the words we sing, they're, they're connected. We don't just randomly like, oh, I don't know, I probably should just raise my hand here. We, there's a connection to those things. And so a lot of times we see in moments of victory, what do people do physically? Hands up. Yes. Yes. And we don't see it as much because stadiums are pretty much empty now and, you know, uh, but we, we get that. There's this kind of universal symbol of victory, like hands up in the air. And so I would encourage you, uh, l like, let's express that to the Lord as we sing together, as we sing, I'm singing in the victory. This, this symbol of defeat, God, that you have transformed into victory for us. Let's express that to the Lord joyfully and freely in this place. And so I would just encourage you to lean in as we continue to sing together. And so, Lord, I just want to pray your blessing over this time. God, my prayer over this morning uh, has been that you would just allow us to grow in fear of you. And so we just pray that you would do that. God, we want to freely worship you in this place. And so move, we ask in Jesus' awesome and precious and powerful name. Amen. I'll be your 
good. You alone are holy. You alone are righteous. You alone are powerful. You alone are to be feared, Jesus. God, I pray that you would forgive us for so quickly being overwhelmed by other fears. And instead, God, you tell us that the fear of you is just going to, it's going to drive those out, Lord. And so I just pray in this place you would move us to greater fear of you, move us to greater surrender to you, move us to greater faith and trust in you, Jesus. We want to see your name lifted high, not just in this place, but in our lives. And so, God, I just pray that you would move us towards that this morning, that we'd be ready to surrender to you, to walk in obedience to you as you call us out and call us up into greater and greater steps of obedience. And so, God, we surrender to what you want to do this morning. Glorify yourself, we ask in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, grab a seat, and as you do, get a Bible in front of you. Uh, start in Genesis chapter 9 again, if you would. The end of Genesis chapter 9, turn there. And um, my hope today, uh, in the next 33 minutes or so, is um, really here's the goal for today, that we would trade comfortable disobedience for uncomfortable obedience. That we would trade comfortable disobedience for uncomfortable obedience. Uh, the fact of the matter is <clears throat> disobedience, you're like, how is that comfortable? Well, uh, sometimes as we don't step out in faith and trust the Lord and, and follow where, where, what he's asking us to do and where he's asking us to go, that can be a very comfortable thing. And yet we can be totally disobedient in the midst of that. And um, I, I, I hope today... Uh, through uh, our unpacking of what, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, what we always refer to as the Tower of Babel. And you're like, how in the world does that statement have to, anything to do with the Tower of Babel? I hope to show us that from the scriptures today. But I hope we can move away from lives uh, pursuing fame uh, for our own name and toward lives that are pursuing fame for the name of God. Um, I hope today we can move away from lives that... Uh, um, uh, might be focused on uh, safety and comfort and the preservation of ourselves and uh, trade that in for lives that uh, are less worried about safety and more worried about just obeying what Jesus tells us to do and where Jesus tells us to go. And so uh, today is a study of a story in the Bible in which God intervenes in the midst of a people who are building a city and who are building a tower. But fortunately for us, we're told in Genesis chapter 11, I told you Genesis 9, just stay right there, but we're told in Genesis chapter 11 why they were building a city and why they were building a tower. And so uh, we might sit here and listen to the story and go, yeah, I'm not building a city, I'm not building a tower, I'm good. But, but we get to the motives of why they are doing that. And I think as we unpack the motives of why these people are building a city and building a tower, um, we will be lovingly convicted by the Holy Spirit to see uh, that all of us are building some sort of Babel in our life. And so um, I hope today we can trade comfortable disobedience for uncomfortable obedience. But I, I want us to start in Genesis chapter 9. Last week we unpacked the ark encounter, uh, uh, what is commonly called Noah in the ark. We called it God in the ark and we looked at God's intervening. Uh, God created the world and he gives a man and woman a command and he says, be fruitful, multiply, uh, fill the earth. He wanted his image multiplied across the globe. Uh, uh, the earth becomes more more populated, but there was a problem. The image is not being multiplied. The people are being multiplied, but the image is not. And so God intervenes with a global flood, and he wipes all of mankind off the face of the earth, save eight people, Noah and his family. And uh, we saw that uh, the floodwaters subside, and, and Noah and the, his family finally get to walk out of the boat, back onto dry ground, and we think, great, uh, a, a fresh start a recreation in which all is going to go exactly as God designed it to go. And then we pick up the rest of chapter 9, Ch uh, Genesis 9, verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from, uh, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And so um, uh, not long after... 
they're off the boat, we have a drunk, naked Noah. And, and uh, someone said to me this week, hey, I'm really glad you're not going to spend the bulk of the time unpacking that for us today. But, but I want us to understand something, that in the midst of this recreation, very quickly we find out, uh, though Noah was a man who was righteous in his generation, as it tells us, Noah wasn't perfect, and Noah wasn't the Savior. Noah wasn't the snake-crushing Savior who would come on the earth, and already we see sin uh, prevailing on earth. Uh, from this, we get into Genesis chapter 10, which is another genealogy. Remember, the genealogies in Genesis are always these linchpins to the primary narratives throughout the book. And Genesis chapter 10 tells us, again, people will populate the earth. They will grow, uh, but the image of God is not being multiplied as the people are being multiplied. Uh, the genealogy at the end of Genesis 10 reads this. I'm in uh, Genesis 10, verse 32. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations. And from these, the nations, what's it say? From these, the nations, what? From these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. That leads us to Genesis chapter 11, which is the unpacking of how are the nations spread across the earth. How does God intervene? Because once again, God has to intervene because his image is not being multiplied. And he's going to intervene by spreading the people across the globe. Um, today, I would just say, is, is we need this message. I need this message. Um, as we look at the account of the city and the Tower of Babel, um, we have to acknowledge that in our humanness, all of us want to stay safe and comfortable and make a name for ourselves. In our humanness, all of us in this room want to stay safe and comfortable and make a name for ourselves. Instead, we have to trade that in to, to offer our lives up to the Lord to say, yes, I won't worry about safety and comfort and making a name for myself. Instead, I will, I will worry about obeying no matter the cost to see your name and your fame spread across the globe. And my hope is that our study of this today will encourage us to that end. And so if you would pick it up with me in Genesis chapter 11. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, this is really important, verse 3, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a what? Build ourselves a city and a... They're going to build a city and a tower. And I know I've been redundant about that, but it's really important that we understand. So often when we turn to Genesis 11, all the focus goes to the tower. But they're saying they're going to build a city and a tower. And then we learn about their motives for why. Uh, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for who? Let us make a name for ourselves. More on that to come. And then they say this. It's so, so interesting. Why do they say this? Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Come, let us, let, us make a, let us build a city and let us build a tower that we might, here's first motive, make a name for ourselves. Here's second motive, lest we be scattered, lest we be dispersed across the earth. I want to take that dispersing point first because I want us to remember what was the command to those who are the image bearers of God? Be fruitful and multiply and Fill the, fill the earth. God, from the beginning till this day right now, wants 
to see his image multiplied across the globe. Now you have a growing people, an earth that is populating, and they say, no, 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 I don't want to leave safety, comfort, all the people I know. I don't want to leave what is known and go out into the unknown. I want to stay right here. Let's build a city. And this day, as you built the city, you built a wall around the city, and they said, let's just stay right here in this city, in this nice little walled comfort zone that we can create. And it leads me to my first point for us here today, that we would reject a life of safe, comfortable staying when God has called you to a life of image multiplying going. That we would reject a life of just staying in our comfort zone, in what is known, when God is calling us to leave and to, to, to press forth into the unknown. Where am I getting this point from the Tower of Babel? I'm arguing before us that the city represents for them self-preservation. The city represents for them self-preservation. Let's build a city that we might not have to be scattered across the face of the earth. Let's build a city so we can stay instead of being obedient in our going. They are staying when they should be going. They are pursuing comfortable disobedience instead of uncomfortable obedience. And with that, simple realization before us, I just, I want to ask us today, where are you holding to disobedient comfort instead of obedient discomfort? Where are you holding to disobedient comfort instead of obedient discomfort? To say it in line with what we're seeing here, where are you staying where you should be going? What is God asking you to do? And we don't have to think hard about it. God has already asked us. And the very fact that he has created us to be image bearers multiplying his image across the globe. Jesus reinforces this for us in the Great Commission when he says, uh, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. That we are to be a people on the go. Whether that going means crossing the street or crossing the world, we are to be people always pressing forward into the uncomfortable territory of advancing the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So where are you holding to disobedient comfort instead of obedient discomfort? I, I, a word to us as a, as a church, as a whole church on this, um, it's going to be super easy for us. You know, we are, we're now in a countdown of months, not years, months, till God uh, entrusts to us our first facility. And so we're going to move from this room and set the curtains and set it all up and tear it all down and we're going to move across the football field and and we're going to have a facility in which to do ministry in and out of and it'll be so easy for us in that day to go we're here it's safe and comfortable And so within the first couple months when the elders and pastors stand up and say, okay, it's time for another church plant. Uh, God has made a way. We're going over to 37 and we're going up to the loop and we're all going to go, no, 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 not now. Don't take me from the place that is set up every week to have to go set up and tear down again. Please, Lord, not me. And yet for the sake of the kingdom, aren't we to always be people pressing forth out of comfort into discomfort so that we can see his kingdom go forth? And I I submit to you that Genesis 11 is not a passage about a church building its first facility in the 21st century, okay? But I do think verse 4 is very, very important to show us that in our humanness, we will always make provision to stay in one place, safe and comfortable, instead of pressing forth 
and uncomfort for the kingdom of God. So you see this city being built. I am te- I, you know, I'm laying before us that I believe the city being built is so that they can stay in one place. But verse 4 also mentioned to us a tower. Let, let's read verse 4 again. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. And then they describe the type of tower they want to build. They want to build a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a what? Let us make a name for ourselves. Man, if we could build a tower that would reach into the heavens, a tower that as you stood at the base of it and you looked up, you could not even see the top of it. Man, the whole world will know us. The whole world will talk about us. We will make a name for ourselves. We will leave our mark on history. Everyone will be talking about it. Everyone will know us. We will be famous. It leads me to my second point today from this passage, and it's this, that we would reject a life of making your name famous when God has called you to a life of making his name famous. So if the city represented self-preservation, the tower represents self-exaltation. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to leave our mark. We want everyone to know us. Um, The there's the funny thing is as they talk about building this tower that everyone's going to know it's going to be massive and huge and 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 man man this will put us on the map and we'll be famous verse 5 actually carries with it a sense of divine humor so they're going to build a tower that reaches into the heavens look at what verse 5 says and the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built do you see the humor there The Lord's like, hold on, what are you guys doing? Oh, that's cute. It's like when we get on the floor and make a little Lego tower with our kid. The Lord's like, oh, look at look at their little tower that I gotta come down just to see. The Lord came down to look at their tower and to look at their city. And isn't that a great reminder for us? That the things that we think this will put us on the map, man, this is huge, this is massive, this will be awesome, everyone will know us, that the Lord is like, oh, isn't that cute? Look at how big the vision of their life is. That we would reject a life of making a name for ourselves to pursue this life of making the name of God famous and known across the the world. Now, um, I, I'll, I'll submit to us, our arrogance and our self-exalting nature, it doesn't usually lead us to grab some bricks and walk into the backyard and start building a tower. Like our arrogance typically doesn't play out like that. Um, but the same heart that we see here We see that same horror in our 21st century selves of self-exaltation. And it leads us to build all kinds of babbles in our lives. And it leads our culture to be building all kinds of towers in their lives where they think, man, this will make a name for us. How, How do we carry forth the heart of Babel into our culture today? Um, A couple things that I'll unpack. Uh, 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 Social media. Now, listen, I'm not anti-social media. I think social media can be used for really redemptive and good things. I I think social media has great purposes and advantages for it. And yet I think there's something that we see inside the human heart. That, man, you give us our space on the internet, we'll tell you all about us. You know, you give me my space. Who remembers my space, right? Come on. Who had a MySpace page? You can admit it. All right. You give a Facebook page. And and like what can be used for great redemptive kingdom advancing purposes can quickly all become about me and my kingdom. Uh, You look at the things we buy or the things we have, if we're really honest with ourselves, just as status symbols. 
Why do we drive the cars we drive? Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any certain car you have. I'm just, just as we see the motives revealed to us of why they're building the tower, we have to just ask ourselves, why do I have to drive the car I have to drive? Why do I have to live in the house I have to live in? Are there status symbols we cling to that if we're honest with ourselves are really about making a name for me? And here's the scariest thing. I don't know when I'm making decisions like that. I don't go to buy the house going, man, I'm so arrogant right now. I'm buying this house so everyone will think we are awesome. You don't say that to yourself either. This is the beauty and blessing of life in the midst of community where we have good and godly enough friends who say, love it, so excited for you. Can I ask some questions? What's driving you to this? I don't know. Is there anything about that that's driven by selfish motives? Stop and go away. We don't want to hear questions like that, right? And so I would just ask us, why am I talking about this? How does this have to do with anything of a people building a tower in this day? It has everything to do it because they're building the tower to make a name for themselves. And I know hidden in this little deceptive heart right here is the same heart I find at Babel of making a name for myself and preserving the comfort and safety for myself. You with me? And we see it right here. And so I just want to give us three heart checks, three, three points of self-examination for self-exaltation. Three heart checks for us. How do we know, because it's so blinding, that I'm actually living a life of exalting myself? So three heart checks, so three pieces of self-examination on self-exaltation. Number one is this, I talk too much. My wife would tell you, I talk too much. And when we talk too much, we usually can get into the realm of talking too much about me. Let me just lay before us something today because I love you. None of us in the room want to be the 62-year-old guy still talking about his accomplishments on Friday night in high school football. You with me? And yet I find myself, oh man, let me tell you about what happened. In high school. What are you doing, Brock? How sad is that? You're 33 with four kids, dude. Wake up. But just a heart check, man, we talk too much. And as I like write this, I'm convicted by it. I talk too much. And I can, I can have a masterful art of steering the conversation with a fake humility way right back so that I am the center of the conversation. It's a heart check we got to watch out for. Uh, the second one, three heart checks of self-exaltation. Uh, we hoard riches. We hoard them. Why? So that we can get more things. Or, or feel more safe. That, that, that we believe this, this, this fake lie that like the more we have, the, the safer we are and the more powerful or the more we matter. And it's reinforced to us by our culture again and again and again and again. The culture tells us we're wise to do this. And yet I don't know if the Bible would agree with that. The third heart check, we're striving for prestige and position. A striving for prestige and position. Now again, you just got promoted. Praise the Lord. Like I, I totally believe the sovereignty of God elevates people into positions on purpose, and he has a purpose and a will in doing that, I'm talking about the striving heart behind it. I got to get there in order to matter. I got to get there for that status symbol of what it means. I got to get there. I got to get there. I got to get there instead of just saying, Lord, I'm just here to serve you. Whatever you want to do with that. And so 
heart checks for us that get back to the heart of what we see at Babel of the people saying, I'm going to build a tower to make a name for ourselves. Now, how, let me just ask you a question I want you to answer. How good is our God? So good. How gracious is our God? When we begin to to strive after a life of preserving ourselves or exalting ourselves, God in His grace will intervene. He will step in and say, I love you too much to let you live a life of all about self-preservation and all about self-exaltation. And we see the gracious God intervene here in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. How many of you have ever been in a cross-cultural situation and you've been just trying to communicate the most basic sentence to someone else? And the other person just smiling and nodding and you're like, um, bathroom. And they're like, yeah. And then you all know what it's like. You just start to talk louder as if the louder you talk, the, be- the more they'll be able to understand what you're saying. We know what it's like to experience the confusion of multiple languages. And so God comes down and he confuses the languages of the people in such a way that they cannot accomplish this task anymore. They cannot work together on this at all. But he doesn't only confuse the language. Verse 8, So the Lord dispersed them there over the face of all the earth. It's a means of grace. The dispersing of the people all over the face of the earth is a means of grace. And they left off building the city. What we have left are the rubbled remains of monuments to self. And if we're going to give the years we have on this earth to the exaltation of ourself, all we'll have left one day are simply its rubbled remains. And the people left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The third point is this. When we pursue safe, comfortable, self-exalting disobedience, God in his grace will intervene. How is this the grace of God? Two ways, this is the grace of God. The scattering of the people accomplished two things. It curbed evil. It curbs evil. And the second thing is this. It advances the kingdom. The scattering of the people curbs evil and it advances the kingdom. How does it curb evil? Remember what God said. These are one people. They speak one language. There is nothing that they won't be able to accomplish. Like you pull the wickedness of all of these people together and you let them communicate freely. Oh my goodness. Uh, How many of you had the friend in school you couldn't sit next to in a class? His name for me was Matt Rosma. We about made a long-term sub in seventh grade just just like phone it in for life. If you put Matt Rosma and I in the same class, in the same table, like, yeah, it it wasn't redemptive. How many of you know that friend? You separate them, it curbs evil. God separates the people here to curb evil. We cannot just let them stay in one place with one language. Who knows what they're capable of doing? But it also gets back to this mission he's given man and woman that his image would be multiplied across the face of the earth. It advances the kingdom. I would propose this isn't the only time in Scripture that God intervenes to scatter his people. Uh, As the church is forming, and we read about it in the book of Acts, we find this in Acts chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all what? They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. 
And so you have this awesome work of God going. I'm not saying the early church did anything wrong for their scattering. I'm just saying you see God intervene to scatter. You have an awesome work of the early church going on. Thousands and thousands of people coming to know the Lord. And I think the Lord understands our humanness. Man, they'll just want to stay right there in Jerusalem. And like, we're a church of like thousands upon thousands now. And this is awesome. We're seeing God move. And God in his sovereignty uses the persecution to scatter the church out abroad to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And in that, his kingdom advances. God will intervene so that we don't settle for a safe, comfortable life, preserving ourselves, and so that we don't settle for something so small and tiny, a life of exalting ourselves. We see it here. We see it in the early church. And we see it in our lives as well. We are to be kingdom advancers. We are to multiply his image across the face of the earth. And God and his goodness will scatter us in order to do that. Um, you know, back to a corporate application of this, it would have been so easy to just keep Pastor Joe and Becca with us here forever. Like all in favor of that. Just said, no, Joe, just stay right here. You want to preach more, bro? Preach more. Just stay right here. And yet for the good of the kingdom, we got to send them out. And then the Lord's like, oh, yeah, you need a church building? Boom, here you go. Let's start another church. Let's see it going. And Lord willing, that's just the first of many. 2021, we got our eyes on Greensburg. Greensburg folks in the room, we hope that by this time next year, you're not having to drive to Greenwood anymore. 2022, Lord willing, we're going to do it again. 2023, Lord willing, we're going to do it again. If you're like, when are we going to stop doing that? The answer is, Lord willing, never. Because we just want to keep multiplying to see his image spread across the globe. But it's not just a church-wide application thing. It's a personal application thing. Are you settling for a life of safe, comfortable self-exaltation? When God has called you to a life that's just faithful, and uncomfortable and exalting his name. Maybe it's time to go across the street and actually meet the neighbors so that God can open a way for you to share the best news we have of how they can come into relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe some of us in this room need to be obedient to move and go. Billions upon billions have still never even heard the name of Jesus. And I think we always assume, well, God calls people not like me to that work. And then we read the scriptures and it's like, Jesus walked by a lake and called fishermen to be his disciples. That the spirit of God is capable of looking at any of us in this room right now and say, um, I'm tapping you on the shoulder. It's time to go. And that's scary. And yet, wouldn't we rather live lives of uncomfortable obedience and stand before the Lord one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Would we really want to trade lives of comfortable disobedience for that? And isn't the name of Jesus worth it? And so we don't have to worry about lives preserving ourselves. Uh, because Jesus has said that uh, he'll take care of us. He's got it. Don't worry about your safety. Don't worry about your comfort. Just obey. Just follow. And he's got it. We don't have to worry about lives of exalting our name. Trying to be people who will be remembered forever. Uh, remember about a year ago, I did an exercise with us. No one three generations in your family, in your own family, will even remember your first name. Don't give your life to exalting yourself. Don't give your life to having to be remembered forever. Instead, give your life to exalting the name of the one who needs to be remembered to, to forever. At the end of the Jesus Storybook Bible, this is how the story on Babel concludes. You see, God knew however high they reached, however hard they tried, people could never get back to heaven by themselves. 
people didn't need a staircase or a tower. They needed a rescuer. Because the way back to heaven wasn't a staircase or a tower. It was a person. People could never reach up to heaven. So heaven would have to come down to them. And one day, it would. So here's how I want to close this today. Um, We're not going to sing anything over you. I think we need to get back to a place within the American church that when we hear the word, the expectation is that we would obey. And so some, some time in silence for you to pray and talk to the Lord. If Maybe if you're with a spouse or with a family, you want to huddle up and pray. And where is God calling you to obey today? And who are you going to share that with this week? Where are you saying, I'm no longer going to be comfortable, dis- comfortably disobedient in this area? I'm going to obey. I'm going to go. I'm not going to preserve self. I'm not going to exalt self. I'm just going to obey. Some minutes of silence is... DJ plays over us and then I'll be back to close us here in a few minutes. that are spent making a name for ourselves and will give our lives to make a name for the one who came and died for us. And so Holy Spirit, would you lead us in this moment and in the moments to follow that we might obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you would stand to your feet, I want to send us out of here. Um, uh, today's message concludes part one of our study in Genesis. And Next week, we turn to Genesis chapter 12, and we begin to look at the life of this guy named Abram, who will become Abraham. And we're going to watch him uh, leave that which is known and head out into the unknown. And between uh, a study of Noah's obedience last week, between a study of God's commitment to scatter his people and their disobedience this week, and uh, between Abram's uh, going out into the unknown next week, we're in kind of a three-week stretch here where I just think the Lord is calling our church to step out in faith. And so I'm praying this week that we would uh, create space and time 
to hear clearly from the Lord uh, through his word and by the power of his spirit and that we would by faith obey and not play it safe and not play it comfortable. All for the glory of Jesus. Redeemer, you are loved and you are sent. We'll see you here next Sunday.